Well, good afternoon again, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Just Don't Blow It, Cobell Land Buyback and Blackfeet's Pecani Money Campaign. My name is Dr. Ian Record, and I serve as Director of the Partnership for Tribal Governance with the National Congress of American Indians. I have the honor of being joined today by Lauren Bird-Rattler, a citizen of the Blackfeet Nation and Project Manager for the Pecani Money Campaign, and Sue Woodrow, who works for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and its Center for Indian Country Development. So let's begin with a brief overview of today's agenda. This is first and foremost about the land buyback program. Um, we're gonna be talking about that in brief. We're gonna be talking about experiences shared to date. And if you think about the land buyback program, uh, in terms of its implementation, we are roughly at the midway point, which really presents all of us with an opportunity to take stock of how it has worked thus far and how it could be enhanced and what lessons can be learned from those tribes that have already gone through land buyback, particularly, particularly with respect to the critical aspect of financial education and the effort to ensure that those native individuals who are considering accepting offers to sell their land interests are financially aware so that they make wise decisions about what to do with the money they receive. As Lauren and Sue will explain, that is what Blackfeet did. It took stock and worked to glean the lessons learned by its neighboring tribes, which led it to partner with Native American Community Development Corporation, Financial Services, and others to develop this groundbreaking approach to financial education that we believe can serve as a model that other tribal nations can customize to their own particular ends, not just when it comes to the Cobell Land Buyback Program, but the Keep Seagull Settlement and other financial settlements featuring direct payments to individual tribal citizens. So let's talk for a minute about the land buyback program. The land buyback prog program is fundamentally designed to begin to alleviate the devastating impacts of the allotment policy by consolidating the fractional land interests owned by individuals and restoring them to tribal control, thereby enhancing tribal sovereignty the ability of tribal governments to govern their lands and their ability to engage in comprehensive, strategic, community, and economic development. Um, I have had direct firsthand experience with this, um, having worked in the past with the San Carlos Apache tribe in Arizona, which is in a bit of a unique situation in that the reservation itself is not allotted, but um, individual Apaches um, living and um, uh, living in, at San Carlos and members of the tribe actually have interests in allotments outside of the reservation. And I worked with one particular family uh, of, of one allotment where there was more than 100 descendant landowners of that particular parcel of land, 160 acre parcel of land. And their ability to uh, come to a consensus and figure out what to do with that land was greatly impaired by the fact that nobody had a controlling interest the tribe had, had no ability to, um, to, uh, to work with those individuals to figure out what do we do with the land, how can we make it a, a benefit to the tribe as a whole. Uh, to date, more than $914 million has been paid to individuals for their fractional interest through the Cobell uh, Land Buyback Program, resulting in the transfer of more than 1.6 million acres to tribal nations. Approximately 243,000 landowners hold nearly 3 million fractional interests across Indian country. There's been more than 100, and, uh, 100 uh, we're up to 105 locations now uh, that have been identified where land consolidation activities either have already occurred or are expected to occur between now and the middle of 2021. And um, it's, it's interesting to note that recently there's been a lot of uh, media attention paid to the fact that uh, the Cobell land, back, uh, land Buyback Program is actually going to run out of money um, before it runs out of um, land that needs to be purchased uh, through the program. And uh, as, as my colleague John Dossett put it in a recent article, it's a, the $1.9 billion that was originally allocated to this program represents a very significant down payment, but it's simply not going to be enough. The fund is due to run out in three years if land acquisitions continue at their current pace. 
Consequently, next week on December 7th, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs will convene an oversight hearing on the program to assess its progress and determine how to proceed. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Sue Woodrow, to continue with the presentation. So thank you, Ian. And by the way, my um, laptop just died on me, which always happens in, in a place like this. So I'm, I'm flying blind. I've got a paper copy of the presentation. So if you could just keep up with me, that'll be great. Okay? Um, yeah. So <laughs> this, this always happens in webinars. But anyway, uh, hello, everybody who is participating. I, we're really excited to share about the Pecani Money Campaign today. And let me give you a little bit of background to, to the actual campaign. So in Montana, five of six of our eligible reservations had, um, have gone through land buyback since October of 2014. Um, in the aggregate, more than 21,000 offers were made. And of those 21,000, 10,000, just over 10,000, individuals actually accepted those offers for a total of just over $280 million, which is not a small amount of money. Blackfeet um, is the last tribe in Montana to go through land buyback, and in fact, the offers were just mailed out this month. Um, there were approximately 7,000 offers uh, sent out for an estimated aggregate value of over $273 million. So um, the average national capture rate, um, and by that I mean the average number of offers accepted to date under the land buyback program is actually just over 44%. So we estimate that if Blackfeet offer acceptances more or less mirror the national percentage, payments could end up totaling more than $120 million to Blackfeet landowners. And the vast majority of those landowners actually live on or near the Blackfeet Reservation. Well, back in April, um, we actually convened uh, a meeting with a number of individuals from other tribes, financial institutions, and other stakeholders at the uh, Minneapolis Fed's Helena branch to hear about um, the experiences with the land buyback program to date. And then we also sought additional um, input from other tribal communities um, across Montana and both uh, South and North Dakota. <clears throat> and, and as we talked with folks, we actually did hear uh, quite a few positive stories about the use of land buyback um, proceeds. But unfortunately, we also heard a lot of um, anecdotal information about uh, scams and fraud, um, a lot of uh, instances of elder financial abuse and just poor money management, um, stories that we really did not want to hear but we were hearing. Um, and generally speaking, I guess what the whole group felt was we were really hearing that there was, there was a significant lack of financial readiness and fraud awareness um, in these communities. And when we reflected on the fact that at that point some $280 million had already poured into Montana's Indian communities um, at, that, at that time, there was a general sense that we were not seeing a benefit of that money in those communities generally. And there was also an acknowledgement that um, the financial education workshop uh, workshops that had been offered um, had been very good in these communities, but unfortunately, the participation rates were very small, relatively speaking. For example, on Crow, um, 200 people participated in financial education workshops uh, focused uh, particularly on land buyback. But there were 2,000 offers that were accepted, so they were reaching only 10% of the offerees or the actual um, offerees who accepted offers. And so we, we started to struggle with, well, we've got Blackfeet coming up. How are, how are we going to address some potential problems in this community as well? So this group continued to meet. We actually moved our meetings 
to Browning on the Blackfeet Reservation. The number of organizations that um, were engaged actually grew, expanded, and generally speaking, uh, am I going too fast for the for the pages turning, Ian? No, you were, we're on track. Okay, thank you, because I just can't see the screen, thanks. But basically the question that we were asking is, if traditional financial education is not effective or practical for everyone, what really will work in the short term to increase the financial readiness of land buyback offerees? And it was out of this question and the discussions that we had in our meetings that the Pecani Money campaign was, was born. Um, the group, which was fairly broad now, and I'll kind of run through who those participants have been in just a moment, um, agreed that we really needed to continue offering uh, what we're calling traditional financial education workshops and trainings, that these are very critical. But we also felt that we needed a very broad supplemental um, campaign that, number one, just would provide these brief sound bites of, of information um, that people could just easily grasp. They could look at and grasp and kind of sink in in very easy to use and easy to access resources um, through a, a wide variety of delivery mechanisms. So we're going to cover all those um, in just a moment. And most importantly, that were widely dispersed, very widely dispersed, and very highly visible through all of the reservation communities over the whole period of uh, just preceding um, the offers going out to several months following the offers going out. <coughs> In other words, we just wanted, felt that we needed to flood the reservation communities with information. And most importantly, that these, um, these messages and this information was very culturally tailored and that the campaign was branded. So on the next page, uh, slide, you'll actually see the branding that was developed um, for the campaign. And we have kind of a cute story about how the Just Don't Blow It came up. We were all sitting around a table in a big group and uh, thinking about, you know, well, what, what is our, what is, how are we going to brand this? What, what is it that we're trying to get across? What's the overall message? And somebody just blurted out, well, we just don't want people to blow it. And that was it. We knew that that was the message, and that has branded the campaign. So Native American Community Development Corporation is a native CDFI on the Blackfeet Reservation. It was actually founded by Eloise Cobell. And we really felt that NACDC was a natural um, lead organization for this initiative. And then we have several sponsors that either sponsored financially or in kind with graphics and other types of, of uh, work. And you'll see those sponsors there. Um, and we're very, very pleased that they jumped on board immediately and saw the value of this type of campaign as a demonstration project. But we've had a lot of partners involved. And in fact, this list that you're seeing um, is not even a complete list because we've had some additional financial institutions come on board and um, other departments and agencies of the tribe itself and other organizations. So it has been a very, very broad uh, collaboration among a lot of organizations very committed to assisting the tribe through the whole land buyback process. So at this point, I would uh, like to turn it over to Lauren to actually get into the details of the campaign itself. Okay, well, thank you, Sue. Well, I think that when we identified um, uh, identified um, the need for the financial awareness um, campaign and, and uh, more importantly, the public relations campaign that we were going to launch in Black Bay Country, um, we decided on eight core campaign messages. And so um, in our meetings, the group focused on the key issues that we were hearing about in other land buyback tribal communities. Um, one of them, just for example, you know, um, when Sue had mentioned anecdotal um, information or anecdotal um, examples was um, uh, someone from another reservation in, in the southern part of the state, um, uh, one of the recipients had received a, a paper check and had gone into one of the check cashing places in Billings 
and um, and paid about eight thousand dollars in check cashing fees to cash her check. And so those were some of the issues that we wanted to avoid, and um, and also were some of the issues that underscored the um, creation of the eight core messages that we developed. Um, for me, I didn't. I'm sorry. So for <clears throat> each, um, we um, developed a slogan. Um, and contact information for organiza organizations serving as resources on each core topic um, is shared in the various media. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the first um, core message that we came up with was um, financial exploitation is abuse. Um, respect our elders, it's tradition, just don't blow it. And so, of course, that particular core message is centered, obviously, around avoiding financial elder abuse and avoiding abuse in general. But more importantly, um, when we looked at the number of cases that were coming out of the um, uh, investigations by the Blackfeet Elder Protection Team, about 95% of them um, had to deal with elder financial abuse. And so um, with um, such a large infusion of money going into our economy, we knew um, from the very get-go that that was one of the um, more important messages. And so it was the very first message that, um, that we came up with. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, the next one was um, we also recognized, just um, to uh, underscore the example that I just gave, um, the importance of, um, of uh, having uh, the recipients um, have a uh, bank account. <clears throat> now, um, there's, of course, um, the, the issue becomes very complex when you think about banking um, <clears throat> uh, because many people that don't have uh, bank accounts don't have bank accounts because they um, don't want a bank account, usually they have charge offs. And so we had to look at um, not only creating a campaign slogan around um, uh, opening a bank account, but also to work with the financial institutions to ensure that they had um, high risk accounts or could um, actually serve our community when it came to um, uh, potential recipients that may have had charge offs or anything like that in the past. And so it was very important for us to identify financial institutions that were willing to work with uh, land buyback recipients regardless of, um, of their credit history and, and whatnot. And so that um, was a very important um, issue for us. And so, um, so that was um, the second um, core, uh, excuse me, core campaign message that we developed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next one was um, recognizing the, the need for um, investments, and certainly investments in our community. And so, um, you know, one of those investments that we think about that um, certainly completes the American dream, if you will, is, is home ownership, owning your own home. And so we wanted to um, uh, advocate for people to um, um, actually invest in their own home. And the land buyback um, uh, program at Blackfeet just happened to coincide with a new housing program that um, the Blackfeet Housing Authority is offering where um, they received the seed money to build 50 new homes for sale. And for every uh, home that they sell, uh, they can uh, um, build a, another home. And so, it's, um, and so uh, we um, structured the, the um, home ownership um, campaign core message around um, the fact that there was already a, a housing um, <clears throat> entity in place that could actually sell some homes to um, land buyback recipients. But we also recognize not only with um, uh, home ownership, but, um, but the ability to um, uh, uh, actually be in a position credit-wise to have, um, <clears throat> to have, uh, to be in a position to buy a home. And so we worked very closely um, internally with NACDC's um, credit builder program to look at um, potential um, low interest consolidation loans to begin to help um, Blackfeet improve their credit uh, so that they're in a better position for home ownership, as well as recognizing that some of the land buyback recipients would actually be able to buy outright. And so, um, so that is um, uh, uh, considering home ownership. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, of course, when we think about investment um, and we think about um, uh, traditionally when, uh, when there's been any large disbursements of cash, whether that be the first installation of Keepsigil, the first installation of Cabal, the original um, Black Sea claim, if you will, or per capita, um, a lot of that money leaves the reservation. And so we wanted to focus on keeping some of that money um, on the reservation. And so we developed the core message around starting a business, 
starting an agriculture operation, expanding a current business, expanding a current agriculture operation, and um, certainly to buy local. When we think about, um, again, the amount of money that leaves our reservation communities and goes um, outside, um, we wanted to ensure that we were capturing some of those dollars on the reservation and contributing to um, our local economy so that we could create more jobs. And so, um, so that particular core message um, was around stimulating our own economy, starting a business, starting an agriculture operation, et cetera. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, of course, this is obviously a very uh, important, um, when we think about financial literacy and financial education, a very important core message. You know, not some don't be a victim, um, don't um, fall victim to, or avoid falling victim to financial fraud, scams, predatory sellers, goods, or predatory lenders. Um, I think that when you look at um, uh, large um, sums of money going into any community, um, I think that you uh, uh, um, act as a lure, if you will, to um, bring in all of those um, types of activities. And so we wanted people to be um, uh, aware of the fact that um, that this amount of money going into any community um, creates a, a breeding ground, if you will, for financial fraud, for scams, for predatory sellers of goods and lenders. And so um, that was a very important message. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and then um, uh, this particular campaign message was developed um, to, uh, well, to underscore the need for financial literacy. When we think about um, the lack of financial literacy or spending habits or anything, not only in just Indian communities, but also in, in uh, minority communities as a whole, I think that um, when we think about, um, um, about being prepared and, and being um, financially savvy and money ready, um, I think that um, uh, this core message is, uh, resonates with, um, with the rest of them, and, and that certainly is to have a foundation for financial um, knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this particular core message was very important. Um, when we think about um, any type of infusion of cash into any economy or into anyone's bank account, we have to think about, especially if we come from suppressed economies, um, how that will affect um, public benefits, um, how it will affect um, TANF, um, SNAP, or uh, the supplemental, supplemental Nutrition Program, um, Medicaid, um, Expanded Medicaid, Social Security, um, uh, and other public benefits, USDA commodities, um, federal financial aid. And so this particular core message was developed to um, just build a lot of awareness around how exactly the land buyback payments will affect public benefits and more importantly um, the fact that um, if you sell your land then you're no longer going to have a lease check, something that um, you, you know uh, many recipients have become accustomed to receiving um, annually or biannually. And so, um, so this um, particular campaign message was um, um, uh, very um, important to us and it's very important to note since we are talking to a national audience that um, obviously those um, those effects to public benefits are dictated um, uh, a lot by by the state that you live in and so um, we had to research um, how, how um, those um, <clears throat> land buyback payments would affect public benefits here in Montana. Next slide please. Um, <clears throat> And, and of course, um, you know, uh, in, investing in um, financially savvy youth. When we think about building um, the foundation for any type of education campaign, um, we need to include our youth and we need to start with our youth um, because when we begin to teach them better habits, it doesn't matter whether it's wearing your seatbelt or, um, or uh, becoming financially savvy, uh, the um, foundation needs to start with our youth. And so, we found it very important that one of our core messages be um, about investing in our future and cultivating financially savvy youth. Um, next slide, please. So um, that brings us to the delivery channels for our campaign. We looked at um, we looked at the infrastructure on the reservation um, because, uh, as Sue had mentioned earlier, we wanted to saturate the reservation, um, our, our native community, with um, all of these um, core messages through various media types. And so the first thing that we did was develop um, uh, a poster on each of the eight um, core messages. And so 
we had, um, uh, I, I think, 250 um, posters of each of those eight core messages, which um, when you think about distribution becomes um, almost prob problematic in getting that many posters out to your community. Um, we also looked at the surrounding communities, and so we sent posters to um, <coughs> Missoula, Helena, Great Falls, um, <coughs> Uh, and other areas here in the state um, where there's high native populations. We targeted Indian centers. We targeted urban health centers um, because um, we also knew that um, many of those non buyback um, recipients, um, though they live, uh, uh, many live on or near the reservation, many also live off the reservation. And so um, we wanted to um, uh, reach those um, uh, areas as well. Uh, we developed four billboards, and, and, uh, and most of um, these campaign delivery channels were um, based on the amount of money that we were able to raise um, to, to actually come up with um, the, uh, the uh, printing, the, the installation, um, all of that um, was really dictated by um, the, uh, the, um, the size of our budget. And so, um, so we developed four um, billboards, two of them right in the Browning area, which is the hub of the Blackfeet Reservation, and then two of them um, on a, a busier highway going into the reservation, I mean, to the to the to Browning, to the hub uh, city. And so, and then we um, looked at four of the more important, uh, or four of the most important um, uh, core messages and decided to um, uh, uh, create billboards out of those um, four campaign messages. Um, we also developed a resource brochure, and we had 10,000 um, of the resource brochures developed. And on those resource brochures is um, a list of our eight campaign core messages, along with all of the resources that are available under those campaign messages. So, for example, um, purchasing a home, we had the telephone number of the Black Bay Housing Authority New Homes Program. Um, excuse me. We also had the contact information for NACDC, some credit uh, builder program. For the um, um, avoiding financial exploitation and elder abuse, we had contact information for the Blackfeet Elder Protection Team. For the um, uh, Blackfeet Law Enforcement Office, for the um, uh, uh, Blackfeet um, Social Services Office. Um, and so, um, so those are just some of the examples. And so that resource brochure was distributed widely along with the posters um, to many other urban um, centers as well um, that um, serve Blackfeet. <clears throat> we developed um, TV and radio public service announcements. And so we're still in the process, actually, of producing some of those radio ads. We currently have eight radio ads up and running um, around the eight call messages, but we are in the process of also recording an additional um, six or eight more that will feature native use. Um, in terms of the um, uh, delivery of those um, uh, public service announcements, we targeted um, uh, heroes or or role models that are from our community. So that included um, uh, native athletes that have um, gone on to college, native um, uh, uh, students that have purchased their own home, um, native retire or native veterans that um, that have expanded their uh, business or uh, started a business. Um, we, we targeted positive role models in our community to deliver those um, PSAs. And so unlike a normal 30-second uh, public service announcement, ours were more like a minute because we wanted um, our, our, uh, the people that were delivering those messages to um, identify themselves, identify you know, um, who they played basketball for collegially or whatever it may be. And so um, we also, uh, so we um, uh, broadcast those radio ads locally on Thunder Radio, the local um, radio station in Browning and on the Blackfeet Reservation, as well as KSEN and KZIN, which is a regional radio station that reaches all of the um, outskirts of the Blackfeet Reservation as well as the entire region. And so um, we ran uh, uh, the television, uh, and which was pretty much a looping PowerPoint on the local cable station there in Browning. And so the um, the campaign messages that were developed for both the posters and the billboards just run continuously 24 hours a day um, on the local TV um, uh, <coughs> cable station. We developed a social media blitz. Um, we developed a, a resource website, um, which is uh, www.thecunningmoneycampaign.org. Um, we developed a Facebook page, um, a Twitter page, and then we did um, several press releases for earned media to news outlets. Um, 
Uh, thus far, um, most of our attention has been focused, especially on the earned media, on local uh, media, uh, because we were so close to the actual, um, uh, between the time that we were funded and the time that we actually had to launch our public relations campaign um, to correlate with the uh, offerings that were going out for the land buyback program, we targeted local media. We're starting to move into the national um, uh, media in, in terms of um, uh, earned media to um, get our, our message out as well because we would also like to serve as a template for the rest of the country and other tribes as both um, um, uh, Sue and Ian had mentioned um, to be utilized um, uh, for the distribution of any large payments. Um, we also put together workshops and out, out, um, outreach meetings and though that says in all reservation communities we've had a difficult time despite the amount of um, uh, when you think about the challenges, despite the amount of advertising that we've done in the local paper, on the local radio, to get people to our workshops and, and, um, and outreach meetings, um, we haven't had a lot of success. We finally started to have some. We had, had um, I think, eight planned last month that we delayed because we only had one person that showed up. But we kind of figured that, that once the land buyback offers were distributed that people's um, interest would be much more peaked and so we're starting to see that and so we have a we did a conducted a workshop last night we're doing another one today and then two more tomorrow and then looking at our tentative schedule for the outlying communities and so um, so that was one of the challenges that we did have in terms of um, uh, buy-in but um, we're starting to see that turnaround since um, the offers have gone out um, next slide please So, of the poster campaign, um, like I'd mentioned, there were 800 posters that were dispersed um, um, across uh, five reservation communities and um, in other areas in Montana. Um, uh, we are in the process of actually sending some to the Spokane and Seattle Indian Center. Um, uh, because of the um, Indian Relocation Act, um, there's a tremendous amount of Blackfeet um, in both the Spokane and Seattle uh, area. Those were the two primary cities where um, Blackfeet were relocated um, in addition to some others. But um, we've targeted those um, just based on the distribution list um, that Land Buyback um, had mentioned in terms of numbers of where offers were going to go. Um, and we actually ended up doing um, 250 posters for each call message. So um, we decided on that after we um, realized that the additional printing would be um, only a few dollars more. We decided to go ahead and, and up that order. Um, but what you're looking at is the campaign poster for um, uh, <clears throat> um, home ownership. It's um, a permanent lodge provides stability. Consider home ownership, and below it, what you can't really see because of the size of the poster or, or the size of the presentation, is the contact information for both um, the Blackfeet Housing Authority and the um, uh, um, NACDC Credit Builder Program. Um, on all of our posters, you'll also see the sponsors listed at the bottom, as well as our Facebook page, and obviously the campaign call message, which is um, just don't blow it. Next slide, please. So um, this is an example of one of the billboards. Um, there are two in Browning and two um, between Browning and Cut Bank. Um, this is the financial exploitation as abuse billboard, which um, uh, um, is, uh, well, this one is right um, in Browning, right uh, on the corner of Main Street. And so it's a very visible sign, and we've received a lot of um, compliments. But um, that's the billboard that was based on the poster. We just had to retrofit the size um, to, to make it um, uh, horizontal instead of vertical for the actual um, billboard sign. Um, next slide, please. Um, the brochure that we developed, the resource brochure, is a quad-fold um, resource brochure. Um, it, it, um, uh, it has a, a list of the eight core messages that I mentioned before. We had printed 10,000. Um, we have them in the local post office, um, uh, the local post offices, um, at the tribal department, at the IHS hospital, at, um, at many of the um, uh, tribal office buildings. Um, around our community um, and the casino, the community college, um, um, at the Blackfeet Agency, where um, and and we really needed to target the Blackfeet Agency, where the land buyback offers actually went out from, um, because that's where they're geared up to do all of the um, notarizing and everything for those that accept offers, and so they have a huge um, uh, 
operation set up and so we wanted to ensure that we were partnering with them to get maximum exposure of our public relations material and so you'll find um, our flyers from our um, sponsors, you'll find um, the resource brochure, you'll find several of the um, posters, and you'll find our our pre-survey so that we can measure um, whether or not um, or how effective our campaign is. Um, all of those you'll find um, right at the Blackfeet Agency, and so that one was um, uh, very important for us in terms of partnerships. Um, <clears throat> next um, slide, please. Um, this is what the outside of the brochure looks like. Um, it has a list of our, uh, in the center it has a list of our um, uh, sponsors as well as our partners, um, a brief overview of, of the campaign. Um, and then I, I think on the right side, um, it, that, that's probably the most basic overview of our campaign that you're going to get. It's helping recipients of land buyback offers make informed decisions. That's the whole purpose of our campaign. Um, uh, about half of the money that we, we received did come from land buybacks through the tribe, and so we had to ensure that um, that um, we were meeting the criteria for the money, uh, for the reasoning that we received the money, and it was very, very apparent from the very beginning that we weren't to tell people how to spend their money, but actually offer them um, uh, uh, services and financial literacy and so that they can make informed decisions. And so that um, right portion of the um, outside of the brochure underscores um, the, uh, the campaign and, and our purpose. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that's how the inside of the brochure looks. Um, you'll see the eight core messages um, on the um, middle and the right panel, um, as well as um, contact information and um, impacts to public benefits on the left side. And so the um, the brochure, we couldn't um, uh, put everything that we would have liked to in there because there was just a brochure. And so what we decided to do very early on was to ensure that through the brochure that we were offering um, resources that people could then seek um, in the event that they wanted additional information. And so it was really a snapshot of the campaign and the resources that went along with the campaign. And we felt that that would be most effective. Um, of course, we'll find out whether or not that was most effective through our post-campaign survey, which will go out after um, sometime in the spring after all the offers have gone out and, and have been accepted. Um, next slide, please. Um, the television PSAs, um, uh, um, they, they are very similar to the rest of the campaign. They're featuring tribal elders, veterans, sports celebrities, educators, and elected leaders covering the eight core messages. Um, we um, advertise them on the local cable channel. They, run, um, they simultaneously run eight ads that we can change at any time, um, and they do run um, uh, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for four months. And so, um, so that was a very good outreach tool. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for our radio PSAs, um, they are, uh, again, uh, um, as uh, television PSAs, they feature tribal elders, veterans, sports celebrities, educators, and elected leaders um, covering the eight core, core messages. Um, they're running on two regional um, stations for four months, as well as the local station. Um, by the time it's said and done for, the amount, for our ad buy, we'll actually have ran about um, 1,600 radio ads, um, four to eight ads a day on the um, regional radio station and eight to 16 ads, ads a day on the local radio station. Um, because of the ad buy for the local radio station, um, we were able to um, actually garner a weekly 30-minute Pecani Money radio show. And so um, from that, and that was just um, uh, ancillary from the radio ad buy, they decided to give us an additional 30 minutes of airtime once a week, and so it allows us to address um, the eight core messages as well as um, core topics um, uh, throughout the duration of the um, land buyback program. And so we've had um, three radio shows, or yeah, you know, we've had three radio shows thus far um, promoting our workshops. Um, one of them was on elder financial abuse. We've invited guests on where they talk about, um, well, for example, the, the radio, um, I'm sorry, the, um, for example, the um, avoiding elder financial abuse radio show that we did. Um, we invited um, guests on and they spoke about what constitutes actual abuse and then how to report it and, and certainly in our community and so um, so that um, so the so the 30 minute 
our radio show ended up becoming an, uh, a bonus for us. But at this time, we're going to listen to um, one of the um, PSAs. Ian? Hi, my name is Ron Radzitador. I'm a U.S. Army veteran and also one of your Glacier County Commissioners. I'm also a proud owner of Sunroads Farmery, a local business that manufactures hydroponic equipment for sprouting grains and legumes for livestock feed. Investing in your own business or agricultural operation with the land buyback payment is a smart investment in our local economy. By creating jobs for our local people, it puts money back into our local economy and it sets your family up to be financially successful. If you are interested in starting your own business or expanding your agricultural operation, I urge you to call Native American Development Corporation at 338-2992 or go to their website at pecunnymoney.org and you can learn more about how you can be successful in starting your own business or expanding your current operation. After all, your investment in a small business or agricultural operation is also an investment in our community. Paid for by the Pecunny Money campaign, just don't blow it. And the um, background music, we had um, Darren Thompson, um, uh, who was a nationally renowned flautist, um, actually donated the music for that and so um, <clears throat> um, for our, our campaign ads. And so that's a, a sample of one of the um, radio PSAs that, um, that um, we developed and that are currently on the air. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so, um, uh, in terms of the social media, our website again is www.pakanimoney.org. It's p i i k a n i money.org. Um, we kind of had uh, the that's the traditional Blackfeet um, the, the way the traditional way that you say Blackfeet is Pakani, um, uh, Pakani, and so. Um, but there was an um, uh, older spelling that was utilized that still appears on our flag, so that became a little bit um, uh, controversial because um, you know, we utilized the new spelling. Um, but I, I think that that's the way that you, uh, or certainly in public relations campaigns, the way that you change things for the past, past is actually utilize some of the latest um, version or, or, or the correct version, if you will. And so we also have Facebook and Twitter, and it's um, at um, Pakani Money. Um, and then um, we also have foreign media, which I had covered earlier. Um, the next slide, please. Um, our workshops, um, we um, are having four workshops in Browning, and um, each on a different topic. Um, we have one uh, workshop in each of our four other reservation communities uh, covering multiple topics. Um, we um, offer our workshops in the evening, and we serve dinner. Um, uh, the dinner portion um, to bring people and attract people to, to the workshop, but also um, the evening um, is so that um, people that um, work or whatnot can also still attend our workshops. Um, uh, the land buyback um, program offered many workshops during the daytime, and so um, we thought that we would um, be would be best serving our community by augmenting um, their efforts and offering workshops in the evening so that people have the option to go um, either in the evening or in the daytime. Um, we have um, multiple partners contributing as presenters. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, just like the radio show, um, we have people from the Black for the um, uh, elder abuse and uh, exploitation, elder, excuse me, elder abuse and exploitation. We have um, uh, members from the um, Blackfeet Elder Protection Team, members from law enforcement, members from social services to um, cover um, what constitutes elder abuse and how you report it. Um, uh, we have the same with the other workshops that we've developed um, from the core eight, uh, eight core messages. Um, uh, the four workshops that we've developed um, offer the same. And so, for example, the financial literacy, uh, we've also invited banks to participate and, and um, sign up people for um, accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, whatever it may be um, at those um, at those workshops as well. Um, <clears throat> also participating um, as presenters in the, um, uh, we're also participating as presenters in some of the Blackfeet Land Buyback Program outreach events that, um, that uh, where we're not duplicating each other's efforts and, and um, where our, our schedules and calendars permit. Uh, the next slide please. 
so um, a part of the reason why we actually were able to get funded was um, that we um, were able to, uh, through the good work of many of our partners, including um, Sue, who presented earlier, um, the uh, concept that uh, we had to substantiate or, or some way show um, how effective our campaign was. Because we don't want to just spend money and create all these messages and not really know how effective they are. And so I think when you think about metrics for any program, um, it doesn't matter whether it's a government, private sector, you need to have ways to measure how successful you are. And so um, a part of the um, uh, a part of what we wrote into the proposal was to do um, a campaign evaluation. And so we've um, uh, uh, we're utilizing Sweetgrass Consulting. And they're doing a pre-survey, um, which um, is pretty much a survey to find out um, how do you plan on spending your money? Um, have you heard about our campaign? Have you heard about any of our core messages? Have you seen any of our uh, ephemera? Um, and so, um, so that we can get a baseline for who, who knows what and whether or not we're being effective. Um, we have an intermediary survey that is going out and then um, a post survey, um, which will say what did you spend your money on? Did you see any of our, our uh, ephemera? Did you see any of our billboards? Did you hear of any, any of our ads? Um, so that we can get a, a good, um, so we can uh, you have a good data on, on um, metrics and, and on the campaign's effectiveness. Um, <clears throat> we'll make available through DOA's, um, uh, excuse me, Department of Interior's land buyback program and Office of a Special Trustee the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Minneapolis, the Center for Indian Country Development, and through NCAI. Um, so uh, from those uh, surveys, we, as I mentioned, we'll have a final evaluation, a final report that will um, allow others to um, um, uh, see how effective the actual campaign is. Um, the other component that you don't see on there that we did mention just in a conference call is I think that when we get, when we um, wrap up um, all of the public relations portion of the campaign, um, I think that we're going to be um, putting together a campaign toolkit that will allow um, other tribes to utilize um, uh, some of the same methodologies to learn from some of the uh, challenges that we had um, to, uh, and for example, you know, when we think about challenges, um, we were ready to go to print on our posters and didn't have, um, uh, and didn't have um, all of the um, photo releases from the people that we were utilizing in our campaign. So when we think about intellectual property and um, and the challenges with intellectual property and licensing agreements, all of those things, um, uh, those are sometimes things that we don't think about when we're just trying to put out a, um, uh, a message. And so those were some of the um, challenges that we ran into. So um, though we were ready to go to print on one of our billboards, um, one of the uh, elders that we were utilizing, her family didn't want us to utilize her in our campaign and so she then backed out and so then we had to start back over and so so we ran into some of those um some of those challenges and so one of the um uh, uh one of the um uh, deliverables that you don't see on the the actual presentation or webinars um is uh, that we would like to create this um campaign campaign toolkit uh, for other tribes to utilize so that um they can um uh, easily access um, some of the resources that um, that we um, took uh, some time to develop. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn um, the last part of the presentation back over to Sue Woodrow from um, from the um, Reserve Bank. Um, Sue. Thank you, Lauren. Um, you know, when we first started, when the group group first started convening, we, we had several objectives after after hearing some of the stories, some of the negative stories and, and sad anecdotes that were coming out of some of the other tribal communities that we heard from. We really had some objectives, and those objectives really have become what we are expecting as our outcome, um, our outcomes. And I think uh, that one of the key pieces of this demonstration project is the um, evaluation, as Lauren just uh, explained to you, that uh, Sweetgrass Consulting is working with us on, and you know we're we're expecting that report out in well, it will probably be six months before we have all of the final evaluation. But we think in the near term, um, and what's really driven us to move forward with this is that we really do expect certain things to happen, and we do expect that more individuals through this campaign will have avoided um, scams and fraud and 
and utilizing predatory sellers of goods. One of the things that we heard um, from a number of our tribal communities were, you know, um, unlicensed used car dealerships setting up on the sides of the highway just outside of the reservation and, and selling poor vehicles at highly inflated prices and things like this. And so we really are hoping that this campaign will help people think twice before they they um, fall victim to some of these types of scams and other things. We hope that more individuals will have avoided falling victim to financial fraud. It's a very, very critical one. And um, I think, Lauren, you're, you're doing uh, radio shows on investments and, and fraud. I think that's the focus of one or more of your weekly radio shows, isn't it? Um, I believe yes, it, it is. is. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, yes, it, yeah. Okay. Yes, it is, Sue. Um, one of the... Um, one of the um, shows that we're going to be doing, um, I think two weeks from today, is on um, the diversity of investments that are available. I think when you think about the common layperson, you think about investments and the amount of money that's going into the community, I think that um, it's very necessary to have a real conversation about some of the um, opportunities that are available for people to invest their money. And aside from the traditional, you know, um, CD at a bank, you know, which um, obviously um, garners very low interest at this point in time, what are some of those other investments out there? And so we'd like to bring in, um, uh, as a guest, um, we're still trying to confirm someone from one of the larger investment firms, just to give us an overview of the types of investments that are out there um, so that um, people can make money off of their money if they choose to do so. That's correct. We really are expecting that more people will have opened bank accounts and are actually using financial services and that fewer individuals will um, have fallen victim to financial abuse. And this is a particularly um, uh, focused outcome that, that we're all very much hoping for. Um, I think the um, avoiding financial, elder financial abuse rose to the very top of our eight core messages. Um, Next slide. Um, we're expecting that more people will realize the need for and will actually seek more traditional classroom style financial education opportunities and resources. We're really expecting more individuals will have started or expanded businesses and that includes agricultural businesses. We believe more individuals will have taken steps towards home ownership and that more individuals will have reduced or paid off debt. And really, more broadly, on the next slide, we hope that what we learn from this campaign will help inform financial education practitioners about effective ways to address sudden money events in Native communities, as well as other low-income and underbanked populations. And by the way, that term sudden money, which I particularly like, was coined by author Susan Bradley who's written a book on sudden money and the whole psychology behind it. And um, if you haven't or you're not familiar with Susan Bradley's work, I encourage you to, um, to look her up because um, it's, it's very applicable to the kinds of things we're seeing with these large settlement payments going out into our Native communities. And also, we hope that um, other tribes who have yet to go through land buyback will find this campaign model particularly useful for assisting their own tribal members and, um, and really helping them to become financially ready and make wise decision, decisions, both about their land buyback offers and also the payments if they decide to accept them. And so um, with that, Ian, I think we're probably ready to take any questions if people have any. There was a question early on about getting information to reservations, and the, the question was posed about how about urban natives that also have land on the reservation? And Lauren, I know that you mentioned some of the outreach you're doing with some of the printed materials to Spokane and Seattle. And I don't know if you uh, have any other further plans uh, that you can share about what, you, what other ways you guys anticipate getting in the word out to Blackfeet citizens that don't live uh, in or near the reservation community. And then maybe, Sue, if you have any other um, thoughts on that you would like to share. Sure. Okay. Well, um, some of the efforts that we did, and one of the reasons why we really um, uh, focused on the social media portion was also because we do know that um, when it comes to reaching our urban counterparts, um, that that they tend to have a much higher percentage of, of you know having 
um, uh, internet service in their home, having home computers, um, um, that 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 type of stuff. And so, um, one of the things that we really targeted when it came to um, um, urban natives was to really develop the um, the uh, social media portions, which meant uh, Facebook, which meant Twitter. Um, and so we uh, we see that just from the likes on our um, uh, posted material that um, that we're reaching some of them. Uh, we also did um, uh, provide them with our ephemera um, at Indian centers, at um, urban health clinics, and other entities, universities, schools um, with with higher native populations. We um, target them as well, and so. Um, so those were some of the things that um, that we did to augment our efforts to reach um, uh, um, <clears throat> urban Indians. Uh, the other is that we also recognize that land buyback, uh, the actual land buyback program, um, I, I know for Blackfeet, um, did hold meetings in Seattle, did hold meetings in Spokane, did hold meetings in Billings, Great Falls, Missoula for those um, folks. And so we allowed them to focus on those uh, meetings where we um, didn't have the money to actually go and do a workshop and so um, so we worked closely with them to ensure that we were also hosting all of their um, workshops and their um, community outreach events on our calendar so that those people that were in tuned into our campaign could also attend um, the um, the um, <clears throat> workshops that Land Buyback was doing. And so those are some of the, the more, uh, I guess, noted um, things that we did um, when it came to urban Indian and urban Indian outreach. I think Lawrence uh, really covered the waterfront um, in with regard to their outreach. I think also, Lauren, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that um, the land buyback folks who are doing that, who are doing the outreach in these other communities, have been taking our resource brochures as well, and distributing them. They have been. Our resource brochures are available at everything that they do, as well as the um, brochures and um, other ephemera from our sponsors and partners. This is Ian. Um, another question um, about encouraging or requiring that financial education uh, be part of receiving uh, or accepting the offer. Um, and uh, we haven't touched on this, and Sue, maybe if you could start with giving a little bit of background about how that is typically done through the land buyback program, um, you know, uh, so, if it's encouraged, yeah. required, et cetera. Well, um, so I want to break this down into two parts. First of all, um, the the federal programs can't require financial education as a prerequisite to um, someone accepting or receiving a payment. So um, it really comes down to encouragement. And the Office of the Special Trustee in the Land Buyback Office in partnership um, do encourage and, and do actually have a, a responsibility under the program for um, for uh, supporting financial education as a part of this program, and and they've been very good partners of ours in supporting this, um, but they can't require it, and uh, so that's why we really felt that the effective way, or we were, we are hoping the effective way to reach people through this campaign is just to flood. The reservation communities and and other communities with this information. If you're, you know, as you've looked at this PowerPoint, it's bright red with black and and blue. These are Blackfeet colors, and and I'm sure, Lauren, I haven't been up to Browning um, now for uh, a month or so, but I'm sure that the community is taking on a very red look with red posters and red billboards and everything mm -hmm. everywhere. I, I mean, people just can't help but see the, this messaging. Um, and so not by force, but really we're hoping that that everywhere people are looking, they're seeing these messages and they're they're taking it in. Yeah, I mean I, I would I this is Ian, I would agree with that. The, the importance of, of when it comes to educating about um, deeply complex issues like this, um, that the saturation approach, multiple uh, multiple methods of delivery, multiple messages, making sure it's omnipresent in people's lives, 
Um, so it's really hard for them to avoid and, and eventually they'll gravitate towards um, gaining at least a basic education by choice um, versus being required to do it at the outset as part of formally accepting the offer. Um, we've had a couple questions come in about the toolkit. Um, and this is something that Sue and Lauren and I have been wrestling with um, because we really feel that given that there are other tribes that are, that are um, sort of on the same uh, time track as Blackfeet, there are other tribes that are going to be following right behind uh, Blackfeet in the Cobell process. Um, the importance of learning and documenting um, the Pecani Money Campaign in real time and sharing it out as quickly and, um, and effectively as possible. And so we're still, we're still fleshing out exactly how we're going to do that. One of the things we'll be doing um, following this webinar is adding all of the uh, uh, webinar participant email addresses to our um, NFEC Native Financial Education Coalition Partner News email listserv. And that will um, include regular updates about what's going on with Pecani money. Um, so for instance, one of the things I know Lauren has been working to do is to get the radio shows that they've been doing recorded. Um, and then we will feature those someplace on, on the uh, internet. I'm not sure if it'll be on the Pecani money campaign site, on NCAI site, maybe on the Center for Indian Country Development site, maybe all three, but getting those up as quickly as possible, getting word out to you that they're available and that there are resources that, um, that you guys can use immediately. And then at some point, once we've developed a critical mass of these resources and documented more about here's, the, here's how they went about developing the approach that they did at Blackfeet, and here's how you can take that template and customize it to your own needs. So Lauren or, Lauren or Sue, I didn't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Uh, if not, we can uh, move to some additional questions. Um, absolutely. There, the only other thing that I have to add, Ian, is, um, is that uh, we currently do have our uh, the radio shows that we've um, done up to date on our resource website, the pecaniamoney.org website. Um, uh, uh, and as far as I know, I think that they're also on the um, uh, Facebook page as well, our, um, our social media Facebook page. And so you can find um, uh, them there. You can also find a copy of our uh, posters as well as our radio ads. You know, we did give one example of the radio ads, but I think that we have um, uh, six of them on the website right now and are in the process of putting the others as well. And one of the things that, that we, Lauren and, and Sue and I have talked about is, is how, do we, how do we make this an efficient process for another tribe that wants to develop something similar to what Blackfeet has done to take some of the, the, the component pieces of the campaign. So for instance, the brochure or the, um, or the um, posters or the billboards and take that, you know, the original design file, for instance, from those things and be able to modify it uh, very effortless, effortlessly to customize it to another tribe. So, you know, removing you know, what Pecani Money Campaign has put in for a logo and putting in another tribe's logo, changing the contact information for where folks should be able to call, changing the, the background picture to make it uh, more relevant to another tribal community, that sort of thing. So people aren't having to reinvent the wheel and trying to mimic what Blackfeet has done, but rather taking some of those raw materials and then, and then fashioning them in a way that they can, they can easily ramp up their own campaign. So there's a question here about um, in what ways do you think this could be applied to Native individuals that get large sums of money when they turn 18 and 21? So this is Sue. Um, well, I think the campaign is applicable to um, all of these types of, of settlement events. Obviously, when you have single payouts going on, a, a full community campaign might not be the most effective way, but where you have settlement payments going out and you have large numbers of people 
receiving payments or significant numbers of people receiving payments for any given thing in a community, I think a campaign like this could be very, very effective. I mean, we're talking about land buyback payments here, but really this campaign is meant to address any type of a, what I referred to earlier as a sudden money event. And so I think it is, I think it is, uh, hopefully, is going to prove to be very effective. And I think it could be translated into a number of different um, uh, types of events like this. I know that we've got tribes in, in our part of the country who are, you know, getting water right settlements and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I'm, we're hoping that this campaign is a broader application than land buyback. Right. And, um, and if I um, may add to that, um, I think that it's also important uh, to underscore the fact that, um, you know, we need to recognize the current resources that exist in our communities. I think that by um, overseeing a campaign like this one, it um, has opened my eyes to some of the wonderful resources that we have, you know, right in our community that you don't always hear about. And so, and then being able to um, to offer a platform for those resources to actually um, uh, um, for people to become more aware of them. You know, um, a perfect example is, you know, some of the the um, financial education and financial literacy um, programs that are offered through the Native American Community Development Corporation, which is based right in Browning. Um, the, the good work that the um, Blackfeet Elder Protection Team is doing, um, not just in elder financial abuse, but in, in um, elder abuse across the board. You know, and so I think that... Um, uh, that uh, that some of the, the that the foundation for the campaign and for the public relations is really understanding and being able to identify what um, resources you already have currently in your community for you that you don't have to duplicate those efforts and actually can augment them. Thank you, Lauren. We have another question here about the workshop session specifically, and Lauren, can you give a little more detail about how those Work, workshop sessions are structured and and sort of more detail about the topics that you cover? Sure. So um, I'll just use the one that is going on this evening. <clears throat> um, the one that's going on this evening is um, understanding the uh, impacts of um, land buyback payments on public benefits. And so we've invited guests to come in, um, well, from the local um, uh, Welfare or TANF department, um, we have um, a young lady coming in that works for the state or the county that um, that uh, distributes those payments that will be presenting on uh, the impacts to um, uh, SNAP, to TANF, to um, um, <clears throat> uh, Medicaid, to Medicare, which um, uh, I think they're minimal here in Montana. Um, <clears throat> to uh, And then we have someone from the local um, uh, community college financial aid office that will also be presenting on um, the impacts to um, uh, federal financial aid. And so if you receive a land buyback payment, how does that affect your high school kid that um, that is going to be applying for federal benefits next year for to underwrite their education? Um, so when we think about some of those core messages um, and some of them that are being developed by our youth currently, um, some of those are centered around, uh, you know, investing in me, you know, start a, a college education for me because um, I'm not going to be able to... Um, uh, get financial aid just because of um, those impacts. So those structures are, uh, I mean, the structure of those workshops um, are, are structured to um, put out that type of information so that people can then make informed decisions about them, about how, uh, what they do with their money. Okay, we have another question here, and I, you just touched on this, uh, Lauren, um, in terms of the, the content of the presentation, the workshop you're going to be doing this evening about um, about how we can go about best advising people who are facing a benefit cliff situation. So um, the question is, can the campaign provide links to state websites or resources that can be helpful, or will people need to do this research on their own in terms of trying to figure out exactly when, you know, an additional sum of money coming into their um, pockets will trigger the loss of benefits in any particular, with any particular program? I'm sure I think that that's a very great idea. We haven't done that yet. I, I think that the, in the amount of time that we've developed the campaign and the time crunch that we've been into um, correlated with the offers going out, which went out last week. 
um, we haven't um, we haven't gone that far. We've developed material that so, for example, again on that um, impacts to um, public benefits. We have you know a, 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 a flyer that is distributed at the workshop that um, that has that type of information. Um, I'm not certain if it actually has the contact information, but um, but that's something that we could certainly add. And then there's a question about how much how much money do you have at your disposal to to develop and undertake this campaign? I, obviously, as as other tribe tribes and tribal uh, officials are trying to figure out if this is something that they can replicate for their own communities, the the big the big question is always going to be you know how much money. And and also I think it, it, Lauren, maybe if you can paint a picture about um, how much. Uh, how much of the partnerships contributed in terms of in-kind donations? Not necessarily money, but their time, their their know-how, things that otherwise would have to be paid for. Um, sure. Well, um, our project budget um, was just over, a little over a hundred thousand dollars. Is what we initially were funded to um, to carry out the deliverables for uh, the project plan. Um, however, uh, when you cover the in-kind contributions from programs from other people, from NACDC staff, from um, uh, the people that recorded our videos, uh, the, uh, the people that recorded our radio ads, the people that, re that recorded, um, <laughs> I mean, uh, allowed us to utilize their photos. Um, the in-kind contributions are, um, I would say, um, are about half that. And so, <clears throat> um, so about, um, so if you were to pay for everything, I would guesstimate that you're, you know, you'd have a project budget for the amount of media that we did, and the amount of outreach that we did. Um, uh, I would say 100, 150,000. However, it underscores the importance of the toolkit, which um, which um, would offer components for all of those things that are already developed. So then you're just, um, you know, doing a little bit of desktop publishing and identifying people in the community who are who would volunteer to do PSAs, who would volunteer to do um, um, other things. Uh, the, the other is that um, when you think about the, the media buys that we did, um, we did so um, because the um, our messages were, you know, a minute long for the radio PSAs. And so um, so that affected the bottom line as well. And so there are, are ways that you could produce a campaign like this, I think, for um, a lot less money, um, especially since the template has already been created. And, and Lauren, I think that I would add to that, um, you know, there was a, a, an amount, you know, a fairly sizable amount that we're paying the consultant to do the full evaluation, the pre-immediate post surveys and final reports. And we're hoping that that report will be useful for other campaigns and that they won't, you know, other campaigns won't have to undertake that expense as well. Absolutely, and that will save them. Um... Uh, a significant chunk. Right, and one of the things I hear in what you, you're you're saying, uh, Lauren, is the the spirit of volunteerism that you have managed to cultivate through this partnership building effort, and really, at, at basic level, getting Blackfeet to own this from the get go. This is a Blackfeet initiative. It's coming from the community. It represents the community. It's about bettering the community. It's not some outside solution that is that has been sort of imposed upon the tribe. This is something that the tribe truly owns. Oh, absolutely. And the more local folks that you get that's involved in your project, the more ownership that the community takes. And so, uh, you know, and I think that probably from, you know, the past we could all, probably all um, attest to that, you know, when you um, give some ownership of something and, and they take it by uh, involving them, I think that, um, that your message uh, on the public relations side then resonates uh, much more when it comes to um, other community members and buy-in for what you're trying to accomplish. Um, we have another question uh, about money coaching. Will there be money coaching or one-on-one -on -one consulting resources made available as part of the campaign? So, you know, if somebody gets a basic financial education through the, the messaging that you're doing, but they're wanting to learn more about how will accepting the offer impact them in particular? What what's available to them through this campaign or elsewhere uh, within the community? Well, one of the resources that you know, and I think that um, when I mentioned earlier about um, identifying the resources that currently exist in your community, you know, when you um, uh, so for at Blackfeet, when we look at the 
um, financial literacy resources that are offered through um, um, NACDC, through the Native American Community Development Corporation. Um, there are opportunities for one and one not across the board when it comes to investments. Um, you know, we could we could help facilitate that, but as a part of the actual public relations campaign, we haven't um, uh, covered that exactly in terms of one-on-one -on -one counseling, but uh, in areas where um, one may want to um, uh, improve their credit or um, or start a business or start an agriculture operation, um, those programs are already in place, and so they would receive um, one on one counseling through um, our, our resource partners and our resource partner programs. Um, but in terms of um, uh, one on one uh, counseling for investments, um, uh, that may be something that we can develop through the through the radio show next week. Um, but currently, we don't um, we haven't identified those resources. So we have a question here about um, getting people to overcome their anxiety about opening bank account. Um, this is, as the as the uh, participant mentions, is a big barrier um, that her people are afraid of opening a bank account. This is something we've encountered elsewhere, and I know Sue, you can speak to this issue. Yes, you know, from the very first meeting, we had financial institutions at the table as partners, um, and which has been very, very heartening. In a number of the workshops, um, we have financial institutions that are participating um, in the financial education components of those workshops. A big piece of what they talk about is banking, the importance of bank accounts, what it means, and then we have bankers there at the workshops to talk with people, to sit down with them one-on-one, -on -one and, um, and to assist them if they are interested in opening a bank account. They also talk about um, and are addressing, and I think, Lauren, you talked about this earlier, where we have issues with people that can't open bank accounts because they, you know, have arrears or, you know, whatever the history has been with a financial institution. And our bankers are, are there to, to work with them through those issues as well as NACDC. So the workshops and our partners um, are aware of, of the fears, of the barriers, of the challenges, and they've been working together to create opportunities through our workshops and other means to break down those barriers and really assist people to, you know, to move in this direction and to become banked. Lauren, you may have some additional information um, you want to add. Uh, sure, and also on our website, one of our partners has a direct link to to um, their page, which um, offers 23 different modules. Um, so if people aren't comfortable with actually going out and, I mean, on the opposite side, if people aren't comfortable with going out and, and talking to someone, um, there are um, those modules that are available that are um, that are just excellent modules, and 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 there and you can access that information directly from our website, and so. I think that we've um, I've tried very hard to ensure that we have um, a wide variety of resources available um, for people to access um, because uh, we know that as a campaign um, or as a public relations um, campaign, if you will, um, that, um, that we um, can't offer all of those things, but we can offer access to them. And so um, a, a good portion of the campaign has also been, um, again, identifying those resources and offering um, uh, information on how to access those resources. Um, yeah, it's, um, this is something that NCI has been working on as well. Um, we launched a pilot last year called Native in the Bank, which was designed to encourage Native youth uh, between the ages of 12 and 24 to open up a savings account. Um, and one of the steps in the challenge was to get them to actually physically go to a bank, meet a banker, develop that relationship. Um, and uh, we've taken our learnings from that pilot and we're planning to revamp that, that initiative and launch it um, sometime next year. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. We have a couple more, uh, well actually a comment that Stu can speak to and then a question. The comment is, um, this would be a great campaign for the regional Indian business alliances in the five states. And that Sue could address this idea um, and maybe expand upon it. Well, it would be a great, um, a great opportunity for the regional Indian Business Alliances. And for those of you who don't know what that is, I can share with you what it is because I've been actively engaged with them. Um, 
Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin each have an Indian Business Alliance. And these Indian Business Alliances, which are broad collaborative um, uh, organizations of many, many partners, also work collectively as a regional alliance and um, with a focus on a principal focus on encouraging small business development, but with a broader a broader mission that expands into things like financial education where it's applicable. And yes, I think this would be an excellent campaign for the Regional Indian Business Alliance to think about more broadly. Um, and here it is, you know, especially if we get the toolkit, you could look at how you might want to adapt that um, and do statewide campaigns. And then finally, um, the question from one of our participants, have you given any thought to creating a plug and play spreadsheet so that individual recipients can estimate the impact of the settlement on current government benefits or scholarships? Um, initially, one of the things that we, um, when we did um, reach out to the state to look at um, the impacts um, of, of land buyback payments on public benefits, um, what we asked them to do was to help us create the threshold for when people would be cut off initially. And so if you're getting this much money, then you know, you're gonna get cut off for this many years. If you're getting this much money, you're gonna get cut off for this many years. And so um, I'm not certain how, how it is for other states. And I do know that, um, that that is based on the state in terms of how, you, how they distribu uh, distribute their um, um, public benefits. But here in Montana, um, after we started to do the initial research, we discovered that um, that the land buyback payments wouldn't uh, would have uh, the impact that they would have on public benefits um, doesn't start until after a year, and after that year, um, uh, if they still have money in the bank or anything like that, which was kind of counter to the messages that we were putting out, um, then they would have to begin to claim that income. And so that's really dependent on the state, but initially. That's um, what we were developing was um, pretty much a spreadsheet based on how much um, you were receiving, uh, with, you know, and, and how that would affect your public benefits and for how long. Because we know um, in other cases that are unrelated to this per to land buyback or this particular um, uh, disbursement of money, that um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, you know, depending on how much you received, would determine how long you were cut off from those public benefits. And so that may be the case in other states. Okay, well, if anybody else is still on the phone, thank you for joining us. And we hope this has been useful, and feel free to contact us. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we're going to wrap it up at this point.